I'm happy that we did, though, because I have more questions. So we talked a little bit about vitamins and, and minerals. What about yeah. what about other other phytonutrients, polyphenols, astaxanthin, anthocyanthins, resveratrol, like that whole category? Yeah, so there's some very good research on a lot of them. And what we were talking in between the break is some of the ones I wonder about. Um, so like turmeric is very popular now and for very good reason. Oh, yeah, I take, um, I take turmeric pills. Yeah, and it, it works really well if you've got high inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, if you also look at some of the better formulas, there's pretty much a lot of them on the market now. They have usually black pepper or something that's going to basically change what's called the cytochrome P450 pathway. It basically makes the turmeric or that compound, whatever they're using, more bioavailable. It actually messes with the liver's ability to detox that pathway. So if you want more bioavailability there, that's actually a really good thing. If you've got super high amounts of inflammation, uh, it works very, very well for that. But I also wonder if you look at nature, um, if we should be kind of bypassing some of those pathways all the time. I think it's probably useful for a specific thing, but if you've got super high levels of inflammation, the next step, you can use that to try to control them, but still try to figure out why your infl you know, inflammation level is super high. Uh, resveratrol is kind of similar. Bioavailability on it's just not really that good. The human data, I think, is kind of hit or miss. So there's some pretty impressive animal data. Um, other polyphenols, like some of the things in green tea, very useful. So there's like a couple. EGCG, is that one? Yeah, EGCG. There is a rat study showing that EGCG in high levels may not be the best for your liver. I haven't really seen that done in humans yet, but again, that's not anything you're going to get from drinking green tea. You'd have to take a supplement, and I don't remember the exact dosage, but it was like really, really high. Right. Um, another one that I find interesting, as you mentioned, is astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a bright red coloring. Uh, you find it like in uh, crab shells. It's actually made as a supplement from a specific uh, algae type plant that's red. They extract it from there. And early animal work on it was like super impressive as a natural way of increasing the body's use of fat. And what it does is it messes with one of the enzymes in there. It's the CPT1 enzyme, so carnitine palmitate transferase 1. It allows that to be more uh, available. It doesn't get downregulated as much. So your body can then shove more fat uh, through the carnitine pathway into the mitochondria. So in some of the rat studies, they showed uh, huge increases in swimming endurance. Uh, they put them in a little thing and they measure how long they could swim. It's probably not really fun if you're a rat because you probably feel like you're trying to drown. But um, the human studies are not as impressive. Uh, one from Van Loon's lab didn't show any uh, change in performance. One or two other human studies in terms of performance didn't really show much of an effect. Um, as an antioxidant, it's very effective. It doesn't appear to spin off as many pro-oxidants. So for example, like we talked about vitamin C, so each one kind of affects a different pathway. And vitamin C, if you take a huge amount of it, starts acting as a pro-oxidant, right? So we talked about if your iron levels are super high, it starts acting as a pro-oxidant. So you get kind of the opposite effect of what you wanted. So astaxanthin doesn't appear to have that mechanism happen as readily because of how it actually works. And it appears to work pretty well to help protect against UV damage uh, from the sun. So I'm very light sensitive. This is probably the darkest I've been because I've been in South Padre for a couple, about two weeks. Um, so I'll take like 10 milligrams for a day, for about a week or two ahead of time. You know, N of one, but it appears to help me not burn quite as much. I still have, you know, pretty much covered up if I go in the sun and that type of thing. Um, so that one may be useful. I, I'd like to see more data on it, but maybe worth uh, playing around with a little bit. You mentioned the the red pigment a second ago. That may any I think of red pigments and, and phytonutrients. I think of lycopene. Yeah, the old one from tomatoes. tomatoes tomato yeah, sauce. Yeah. I feel like I used to hear about it a lot more than I than I have lately for for some reason i don't know if i'm just like out of that world more than i used yeah. to be or what, but uh, i have a theory look. that it was mm, a lot of the supplements were paid for i think it was prostate research <coughs> and what they found was a lot of uh, sauces were high in it because you actually had to break the cellular wall to get access to it um one of the little kind of dirty insider secrets you find is that 
if you're, let's say, theoretically, a manufacturer of cherries and you get rid of a lot of cherry skins or byproduct, it's your incentive to try to figure out, hmm, could we sell this to a supplement company and maybe they could find something useful with it. Totally. It's like, um, it's like cheese makers and whey protein. Which that's exactly where that came day. from. <laughs> yep, they used to literally throw yeah. gallons and thousands of gallons every year of whey protein down the drain because yeah. it was a byproduct of the cheese manufacturing. It's like a big liquid that comes off. You go to, if you have yeah. to go, like I've been to the Tillamook Cheese Factory many, yes. many times. Yeah, I've been there too. Yeah, yeah. it's a dope place to go if you've <laughs> never been awesome. to it before. That's yeah, great. And, and you can see all the whey just like running off as a liquid. They just dry it out and you got protein. Yep. Protein powder. Yeah, so a lot of times those things I think can be beneficial, but... I'm always a little weary of looking at disclosures on studies and who funded it. And if all the studies are only from the same funding source, it doesn't automatically mean that it's bad. But you have to realize that they have a pretty big incentive to show a positive result. So you may only be seeing you know, legit studies, but you're maybe only seeing the positive ones. You may not be seeing some of the other ones. And then also, if people are listening, if you do work for a supplement company, let's say you're an academic, the first question I'll ask them is, who owns the data? So if you were to contract me to work for your supplement company, many times it'll say that you still own the data. So if I do it thinking I'm going to get a publication out of it and you own the data and the study doesn't show positive, you're probably going to keep the data and not necessarily publish it. Right. Again, that doesn't happen all the time. And you will find some companies that have research that eh, it wasn't necessarily positive that's still out there. But I always wonder if there's two studies and they're like super positive. Maybe it's a good thing, but I always like to see that then verified by someone who doesn't have, you know, any disclosures in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, what about something like anthocyanthins that are in blueberries?